Great. Well, hello and welcome to our housing series, uh, Housing for All. I'm Marika, I'm the Executive Director of the Cambridge Historical Society. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you here. Uh, I'd like to offer a special welcome to some of our elected officials. Ken Reeves, former mayor, is here. Um, and two city councilors, Dennis Carlone and Mark McGovern, thank you for joining us. I know a lot of um, people couldn't join us tonight. Apparently there's a lot going on in the city, you may have heard. Um, but we are happy to be having this series filmed, so you'll be able to see that. So, how many people in the audience are Cambridge Historical Society members? Yes, nice, thank you, wow, what a great showing. Um, so for those of you who didn't raise your hands, great news, you can sign up today. Um, just outside, any of us will be happy to sign you up. Um, you can also, uh, we accept credit cards, check, or online at cambridgehistory.org. We are a private nonprofit, which means we don't rely on any city, state, or federal funding for our operations. We rely on the generosity of Canterburyans like you to continue programs like these. We also preserve our headquarters, the Hooper Lee Nichols House out on Brattle Street, the second oldest building in Cambridge. How many people have been? Excellent. Well, we're having an open house soon, so please come if you haven't been in a while. We also have historical research collections. Thank you for your support and confidence in all of our work. If you find value in the kind of work that we're doing, um, I know a lot of you have said when you were coming in you were surprised an organization like ours is doing this. If that's something that's important to you, I hope you'll consider supporting us. Um, we definitely cannot do this work without your help. What we do literally could not happen with the incredible support of our volunteers. So if you are interested in our programs and events and you want to serve on a committee or volunteer your time in our office, we would be very grateful. I have to say we have the best snacks and we're very nice to work with. So um, you, you wouldn't be wasting your time. So in addition to the generous support of our members, I would like to thank our sponsors for our Housing for All series. Alexandria Real Estate Equities, Bullfinch Properties, Capital One Cafe, they're here tonight, HYM Investment Group, Eastern Bank, Harvard Square Business Association, Graffito SP, Leader Bank, North Cambridge Cooperative Bank, and Whole Foods. So thank you to our very generous sponsors. I also want to extend a very, very special thanks to our lead sponsors, Cambridge Savings Bank and the Mass Foundation for the Humanities. Cambridge Savings Bank has been a great supporter of the society since we were founded. So thank you so much to Cambridge Savings Bank and Mass Foundation for the Humanities. If you don't know about this organization and you like the idea of an event like ours, you will love the work of the Mass Foundation for the Humanities. Please go to their website and see what they're up to. So why is the Cambridge Historical Society holding an event about housing? The society recently made a very important decision. Because we believe that the history of our city is relevant to our lives today, going forward we will focus on issues that we as a city are facing and offer the historical perspective. We intend to help you understand how we got here so we can all think about solutions, so we can problem solve better and smarter. We intend to use history as a guidebook the stories, motivations, interests, and decisions of those who came before us need to be told, explained, and discussed. That said, we don't see ourselves as hosting a current issues forum. Instead, our goal is to slow down these issues and use history to examine them. We are asking each other, how did we get here? What happened and why? What's my role, my responsibility in solving this problem? That's the work of history, the work of our historical society. And there are three tools that we use. One, humanities. We are approaching this issue that is on the minds of everyone in Cambridge through humanities lens, specifically a historical one. This is different from how other groups approach these topics where they use data. We use stories. Perspective. Through our expert panelists, we are proving, we are providing you with background so you have more information to inform your conclusions. We hope that this background augments what you already know. We hope some information will surprise you. We're looking for raised eyebrows, nudges to the friend next to you, and audible wows. There's a lot we don't know, a lot we take for granted, and a lot that we forget. And the third is empathy. As you have no doubt already heard me say, history is everything. History is not just the pursuit of armchair history buffs or memorizing battle dates. 
It's not static facts. It's the web of stories that define us as human beings. It is the remembering and reflecting on the events of the past so we become more empathetic people, so we are humbled, so we are better citizens. So together we make a better city, a better world. That's the work of historians, amateur professional, and that's what we are hoping to do tonight. There's so much to cover on this topic. We have three events, as you know, but we could have had a dozen. Um, so thank you for keeping this in mind as we have to rush through hundreds of years of Cambridge history. Um, I do want to review that we have some three ground rules for tonight. They can also be found in the conversation guide that you received. One, active listening. Pause and repeat back in your head what you heard before speaking or raising your hand. Don't just hear, absorb all you've observed. Two, ask questions based on genuine curiosity. And three, speak and think with empathy. Be a historian, that is understand the life circumstances swirling around a person is what led them to a decision. Think about these conditions before passing judgment. I do have some housekeeping to take care of. Tonight's event features short talks with three great speakers, followed by a discussion moderated by Representative Decker. We will then open up the conversation to you through microphone, just there in the corner. So if you have a question, we hope you'll walk up and ask and wait your turn. Um, we also have note cards in the back near Lynn. And um, if you don't want to come to the microphone, you can write down your question and pass it up. And our panelists will answer it. Keep in mind that what we discuss tonight will not be forgotten. We're being recorded by our friends at CCTV. Um, it's going to air in a couple weeks. Um, but we're also taking notes and writing everything down for two purposes. One is to pass up to the city to inform the master plan and vision Cambridge. And two, what we talk about tonight is, will be recorded in the historical record. So what we talk about will be um, written down, will be put in our archives, and then 100 years from now, everyone will know what we as Cambridge were facing and thinking and feeling about this issue. And don't you wish that existed from 1916? That's the work that we're doing. Um, if you are on Twitter, we are at Cambridge HS, and the hashtag is housing for all. So please participate. You can also join a conversation on Facebook or Instagram. The speakers from all the conversations have sent us suggestions for reading, and those are in your handout. Also, our friends from the Cambridge Public Library have some um, books that they've laid out on the tables that um, they want you to think about as you read as well. There are three great repositories here in Cambridge with historical collections. And one is ours, the Historical Society. Two is um, at the Cambridge Historical Commission. Emily Gonzalez will help you with anything you want to know there about the history of buildings in the city. Also, you can corner Charlie after the talk. And Alyssa Pacey here, who is the archivist for the library, has a beautiful exhibit up on her room, the Cambridge Room. Has anyone been up there? Beautiful space. I hope you go check it out. Um, she, all three archivists in the city are so kind and so willing to help you answer any of these questions about housing. Finally, there is a survey in your guide. Please fill it out. We listen to everything that you say. Um, it's really important for us to know what you think. Um, for our own purposes, but also it helps me ask for money. So please fill that out. Thank you. Um, silencing your cell phones would be wonderful. That is a thing that you can do. Thank you. I'm so pleased and honored to share the stage today with such great Cambridge experts. I would like to introduce tonight's moderator, Representative Marjorie Decker. Marjorie Decker was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 2012 representing the 25th Middlesex District, which includes parts of the Cambridge neighborhoods of West, North, Riverside, Cambridgeborn, and Mint Cambridge. She currently serves as Vice Chair of the House Committee on Global Warming and Climate Change, as a member of the House Ways and Means Committee, and as a member of the Joint Committees on Healthcare, Financing, and Housing. Marjorie is also a former 14-year veteran of the Cambridge City Council, where she was a strong voice for social justice in the local community. For her final three terms, she chaired the Council's Finance and, Fud Finance and Budget Committee, the first woman to ever do so, and has also led its public health and housing committees. She was one of only 13 women to be elected to City Council in more than 150 years and served a term as Vice Mayor of Cambridge. Marjorie's deep roots in the community having grown up in public housing in Cambridge, a stone's throw from where she and her family now reside. She was the first in her family to graduate from high school at Cambridge Ridge in Latin. She then went on to graduate with honors at UMass Amherst and earned her master's at, Hen at, at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government in 2007. 
Prior to her work in Cambridge, Marjorie taught first grade, was a special education teacher with Teach for America in Louisiana. Outside of state and local government, she has a life. Um, she enjoys spending time with her husband and her two children. Um, please join me in welcoming tonight's moderator, Representative Decker. My hot mic is it on. Yeah. Um, let's see. I want to say thank you to the Historic Commission for hosting this forum, and, and the fact that it's not just a one evening discussion, I think, is really important. Uh, this is an issue that is one of the, I think, the issues that impassions almost everybody who lives in this city for a lot of different reasons. Um, people have lots of strong opinions about the topic of housing in general. And I want to say especially, um, I am really happy to be sitting here to look over at my former colleague, the great mayor, Ken Reeves, who was really my champion and partner when it came to advocating for affordable housing. Um, I also saw Councillor Carlone, who is here, and I know we've acknowledged Vice Mayor McGovern, and school committee member Fred Fantini, all great um, advocates of affordable housing. This conversation, of course, is not just about affordable housing. It, it's about housing. Um, I will tell you uh, quickly, there's a few things happening in the legislature that we, when we, I sit on the housing committee and I have for um, the last two terms. Um, we also ha are really lucky to have a Cambridge resident here, Sean Tierney, who's also a researcher in the house, Joint Housing Committee. Um, Sean, why don't you say hi so everybody can come ask you questions afterwards. Um, is a great resource. Um, but just to say, there's a, there's a few bills right now in the legislature that would impact our ability to be able to meet the demand. As you will know from our esteemed guests, and I'm really excited to be sharing the stage here with three incredible people, I said this would be the kind of conversation I would want to come listen to, so the fact that I have to be here is even better, because then I won't miss it. Um, we're not meeting the demand for the need for housing, both affordable housing and, and market rate housing, and we have legislation pending, and will probably be refiled, that would, one, really for force suburban communities to allow more multifamily housing to be built. Currently, outside of the Cambridge and Boston area, um, you, you, you don't have multifamily housing being built on plots of land, and so they couldn't possibly meet the demand. Um, there's also legislation that would encourage and incentivize um, our ability to build housing faster in, in various communities. I also would be remiss if I did not note that um, people's ability to pay for housing also matters. And we have right here and amongst us in our community one of our largest employers where workers who are asking for a base salary of $35,000, um, which then, by the way, even with that base salary, would still need government subsidies to be able to afford to live in Cambridge. So we have the Harvard Dining um, Common workers on strike. So all of that matters when we talk about how we build housing and what housing looks like. Um, with that, I want to um, introduce our first speaker. Karen, are you our first speaker, I believe? You are, Charlie Sullivan, okay. Char I have to tell you, um, so Charlie Sullivan is, um, I, I think really he's one of the caretakers of our history um, in our community, both the physical history and our oral history, um, and was one of the very first people I met almost 20 years ago when I was first elected to the Cambridge City Council. And one of my highlights was taking a walk with him through Cambridge, through Harvard Square, and learning more about our community and its history. So, he has served as the executive director of the Cambridge Historical Commission since 1974. He graduated from Dartmouth College with a BA in geography in 1965 and received a master's degree in city planning from the Harvard Graduate School of Design in 1970. He's co-author of A Photographic History of Cambridge, Maintaining Your Old House in Cambridge, and Building Old Cambridge, Architecture and Development, which has just come out, looks like, 2016. Yep. Um, can we get it in the local bookstores? Two weeks. Two weeks, okay. You heard it here. Hot off the press soon. Um, Mr. Sullivan is a member of the Massachusetts Historical Commission and a fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society. He is also a former president of the Cambridge Historic Historical Society and a former trustee of Historic New England. Um, it is really a pleasure for me to be sitting here on the same stage as you. Thanks, Marjorie. I was thinking, wow, who is that guy as you were introducing me? So the history of Cambridge is in large part a history of um, its housing, but um, it's a question, uh, the matter of housing in Cambridge is a question of demographics and geography. I'll start with geography. When Cambridge was founded in 1630, 
It was three miles by water up the Charles River from Boston, which is seen here on its peninsula, uh, surrounded by the Back Bay and Boston Harbor, but eight miles by road through uh, Brookline and Roxbury, or about five miles and a ferry ride through Charlestown. So Cambridge was isolated. It was an isolated New England town. Uh, it was founded to be the capital of Massachusetts, but the legislature decided Boston offered more advantages, and so they gave us Harvard College as a consolation prize in 1636. So the originally, uh, in, and for the first almost century and a half, there was only one village in what's now uh, Cambridge. Cambridge extended at one time from um, uh, Newton on the south to almost to the Merrimack River on the north. By 1807, it was reduced to its current boundaries. The one village was the village at Harvard Square, which is shown in a French uh, uh, map here as having 80 houses and one university. The houses were something like this. Um, this was a... Um, a 1725 house, but not much different from the houses that were built in the first period in, in the village. Uh, this house lasted on JFK Street until 1900. You can get a sense of just how small and perhaps how mean uh, some of the accommodations were for working people in the village at that time. Uh, prosperous farmers occupied houses like this, uh, now on Elmwood Avenue, but built on Russell Street in North Cambridge in 1757 and moved to Elmwood Avenue in 1960. Beginning in about 1750, uh, the farmland and pasture land that was, uh, had been occupied by the Puritans and their descendants for 130 years began to be bought up by West Indian planters who were finding the climate in Jamaica and Barbados um, unhealthy and looked to, to um, uh, develop summer and then year-round residents in New England, uh, in, in uh, Rhode Island, on the Charles River, on the Mystic River. Uh, but here, uh, this map shows the, the, the amount of Cambridge territory that was acquired by these um, upper-class loyalist um, um, Tories who depended on their plantations in the West Indies for um, their economic existence. Uh, the significance of this map is that these areas were among the best land in Cambridge, and as they were sold or confiscated and then purchased by the American uh, revolutionaries, uh, they were fairly well curated and then subdivided in the suburban period in the 19th century. Uh, areas outside of this, these estates were more randomly divided um, um, at various times. So the upper class, of course, lived in houses like, like this, um, the John Vassell House that's now owned by the National Park Service, or Marika's House at uh, the Hooper Lee Nichols House at the Cambridge Historical Society. Uh, all of these were owned by, by the loyalists. The, uh, the geography changed in 1793 when the first bridge was built direct to Boston. Um, in 1793, there were only three farms between Harvard Yard uh, and all of East Cambridge and Cambridgeport. Uh, it was just a very, um, it was worn out pasture, marshland, uh, very little bit of agriculture, uh, not prosperous at all. But there was this enormous desire line that was satisfied by the construction of the West Boston Bridge uh, between Boston, which is seen here with the State House on the, on the right, uh, on top of Beacon Hill, and um, Western Massachusetts, Southern New Hampshire, Southern Vermont. So within um, a little over 30 years, at the time of this map, there are two bridges now, and all of the streets east of of Harvard University are laid out to connect to those bridges or to provide uh, suburban accommodations uh, for um, 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 or, or living accommodations for people who are settling in two brand new villages, East Cambridge and Cambridgeport. All of these streets were laid out as turnpikes or as part of real estate speculations. Hampshire Street, so called because it went to New Hampshire. Uh, Broadway was the extension of the Concord Turnpike. Western Avenue went west, all the way west, uh, River Street and so on. Uh, these are uh, major long distance routes that all cross the formerly empty farmland of Cambridge, converge at Kendall Square or at Leachmer Square, and then go into Boston. 
So these became the first mass transit routes um, in, um, in the Northeast. The first horse car line um, outside of New Orleans was built between downtown Boston over today's Longfellow Bridge through Central Square and Harvard Square to Mount Auburn Cemetery in 1853. Uh, that was soon followed by these other routes that are marked in red on this, this map. The uh, bridges were toll bridges until 1854. Uh, when the tolls were lifted, then uh, Cambridge became more of a, of a possibility for uh, people moving out of the North End and Boston, other Boston neighborhoods and looking for a suburban existence. So the three villages had very different character and very different housing stock as a result. East Cambridge, which is seen here, uh, looking from the State House um, past um, the Charles Street Jail with East Cambridge in the far distance, was an industrial, a planned village um, with industrial roots. Uh, it was also the site of the Middlesex County Courthouse from um, 1830, but the main rationale was industry. The New England Glass Works at first, and then other industries that followed. The housing, such as this, this view on Winter Street, East Cambridge, it was workers' cottage or workers' cottages built for built for glass workers, um, often uh, containing uh, several families um, and borders. Housing conditions in industrial East Cambridge were um, extremely poor. You can just imagine living on uh, Monroe Street at the corner of Third, uh, next to this uh, gas holder. Uh, this is now the uh, site of I think it's the Watermark Apartments on Third Street and Kendall Square. Uh, things have changed uh, a little bit in this neighborhood. Uh, Cambridgeport grew up around Lafayette Square. Uh, the, uh, the meeting house here was at the intersection of Main Street, which is going off in the center, and Mass Avenue was in the foreground. Uh, this was where all of those tradesmen and farmers from northern and western New England would come and spend the night um, before going to the market in Boston uh, the next morning. Uh, it became a suburb. Uh, a suburb that was written up in the New England agriculturalist as being a, um, a clean and fresh and salubrious place to live. Uh, this Greek revival cottage we think was on, uh, was identified as being in Cambridgeport and we think it was on Cottage Street. Uh, Cambridgeport um, was like a uh, western town. Um, practically, you know, sp springing up practically overnight um, on virgin ground. Uh, with no, you know, real uh, planning, there well some basic planning in the street layout, uh, no real economic generator like East Cambridge had the industries in the courthouse. Cambridgeport develops as a suburb uh, for people from northern New England, uh, from farming uh, farmers, farming communities are coming here. You know, a generation later they're going to Ohio or to uh, Western New York or to Illinois. In, in this period, they're coming to Cambridgeport and making their fortune. Um, middle class housing is, is uh, prevalent in this part of Cambridgeport, and so is multifamily housing as density increases um, as the transit links to Boston uh, get, uh, get closer. The area of East Ca Eastern Cambridgeport that we call the port, or more recent, or recently Area 4, is, uh, became by the 1870s the densest part of Cambridge, and uh, the part that was um, of Cambridgeport that was oldest began to have the most deteriorated housing, uh, began to have some social issues, but it was also an area where industry was, um, was settling along the, the river, uh, uh, wars were serving river traffic. The railroad came through in the 1850s, um, was a nuclear uh, catalyst for industrial development. And so in a very small area, you had a range of housing um, and social conditions. This is Broadway looking west to Columbia Street. The building on the left uh, still exists, although it no longer has its uh, conical uh, ta uh, top. On the right, um, that's now Linwood uh, Court, where that Greek Revival house is. So the two houses is now a, a corner um, filled with three-deckers from the 19-teens. But just to the south of that, uh, Clark Street barely exists today, but it ran north and south between Broadway and Main Street. In that area of the, of the lower port, 
uh, that had the earliest settlement and the densest settlement. Uh, and this photograph taken by the city engineer in 1901 uh, shows the range of working class housing here. Um, uh, the brick two family from 1855, uh, the single family from um, 1868, and the range of um, uh, diverse racial, ethnic, and economic groups that were settling in this area. There were new three-deckers there um, in 1901. Um, absentee landlords were building houses like this to rent. Um, but the area was, by the um, early 20th century, was considered to be a problem for the city, uh, I think partly because diversity was considered a problem. It was Cambridge's leading minority neighborhood, uh, partly because of industrial um, industries nearby, um, uh, partly because this developed in the era before zoning was adopted in 1924. So you can see, uh, you may be able to see here the mixture of uses uh, that are represented, the Cambridge Rubber Company right at the bottom of the slide, um, uh, mixed in with residential development. This kind of indiscriminate mixture of uses was considered um, really unhealthy and was in fact uh, un unhealthy for nearby residents. So in the 1930s, uh, the city was the first to take advantage of the new federally funded housing programs that were part of the New Deal uh, that were intended to replace slum conditions with uh, modern housing on the European model. Uh, this is Newtown Court as um, uh, as completed. Uh, that's in the area that is shown on the, on the previous slide. Uh, Washington Street at the top, Main Street at the bottom, and uh, Columbia Street on, on the left. Um, this is, um, and, and at the top of the slide is the area that's now uh, occupied by uh, Washington Elms. And you get a sense of the enormous contrast in design um, and social engineering, the thought that went into providing uh, this housing. On move-in day in January 1938, um, something like 230 uh, white families moved in. Uh, one black family moved in. Uh, these were families that were uh, carefully selected by the Cambridge Housing Authority um, to, um, for the privilege of living in this modern housing. The, uh, the city's housing efforts in this period went ahead with more and more uh, public housing. Newtown Court uh, opened in 1942 uh, with another 324 units. Then after the war, Jefferson Park in 1949, uh, Roosevelt Towers in 1952. Uh, Representative Decker will re recognize this with 228 units and a mixture of medium rise and high rise buildings. Uh, and then, and so in 1950, the Housing Authority uh, could claim one of the most productive records of any housing authority in the country with 10 projects completed containing 1,700 units um, in 15 years. After that, things went downhill fast. Um, the, the social engineering that is um, present, uh, you know, the development of denser and denser public housing units uh, uh, transformed it into a private housing uh, investors developing projects like this under the zoning that was ado adopted in 1962. Uh, there could have been a fourth tower on this same parcel of land uh, and still would have been of right without any zoning um, um, uh, permission required at all. Uh, 500 units and range towers. So. The, de the demogra demographic end of the question, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this graph shows you the, the trend of Cambridge population growing exponentially in the late 19th century, uh, peaking in 1930 at 113,000, excluding students and people in dormitories, and then dropping by almost 30% to a little over 80,000 by 1990, and now rising again. Uh, between 1990 and 2000, rent control is abolished. Uh, that's not reflected so much in the demographics, but as it is in the social and economic composition of the housing, of uh, renters and owners, and of course in the housing, housing market. The city um, in the post-war period was desperate for development with that drop in population meant uh, an eroding tax base or industries were leaving. Uh, the city took advantage of urban renewal authority to demolish the Rogers block, which stood on Main Street 
and, um, and eventually all the factories in, around Kendall Square as, uh, by the Cambridge Redevelopment Authority. This was a, an occasion for public celebration in 1957 when the bulldozers arrived at the Rouchers Block and the Ringe um, Band turned up to, um, uh, to celebrate. We got Tech Square as a result, uh, which is the, the catalyst. Yes, I got that. Five minutes, I'm, I'm hearing, five minutes or less. Um, Tech Square is the catalyst for the, ec the incredible uh, high-tech, uh, biotech economic revolution that followed um, after several more decades of not much activity uh, than an explosion that has fed uh, demands on the housing market. But in the 1950s, it was this question of rehab or demolish. These are houses on Putnam Avenue being demolished for Putnam Gardens. Uh, the city um, formed a committee on home hygiene in 1952 to examine uh, conditions in lower Cambridgeport near Fort Washington, found uh, that housing conditions were uh, really adversely affected by the um, junkyards and scrapyards and trucking terminals that um, populated that part of the city and enumerated um, the deficiencies, the shared baths, the lack of baths um, uh, um, in, the, um, in the neighborhood, and the mainly three-decker neighborhood. Three-deckers were always an issue. Uh, they be appeared beginning in about the 1890s with flat roof technology. Uh, they were economically efficient. Uh, they were uh, considered to be um, harbingers of social change by the established neighborhoods in Cambridge. The city uh, went back and forth on banning them. Uh, the legislature allowed uh, communities to ban tenements, meaning three-deckers, um, in the early 20th century. Um, uh, Arlington or Belmont, towns like that, uh, banned them early. Cambridge banned them for a while around the First World War, permitted them again. Uh, the problems were that they were flimsily built uh, before zoning. They could be as close as three feet apart as these two on, on Howard Street. Uh, they were considered to be beyond the economic means of the owners to maintain, and, um, and on and on. Uh, but in the 1920s, they were the housing um, uh, uh, solution of choice. Uh, Three-deckers and two-family houses you can see proliferating on Chilton, Standish, and Lakeview Avenues in this aerial view from 1929. Uh, the three-deckers I looked up on Standish, uh, none of them are assessed today for less than a million, uh, a couple of them up to a million two. Uh, the two families almost as, almost as much, and the one single family that's here somewhere is assessed for over two million. Um, an astonishing um, development in the last couple of decades. So uh, quickly, what's Cambridge been doing? The City for Affordable Housing, the Community Preservation Act adopted in 2002 um, has allowed us to invest $130 million uh, in producing or protecting expiring use units or producing new affordable housing units. Uh, six million of that comes from historic preservation grants through the Cambridge Historical Commission. So Jefferson Park rehab, um, home, working with individual owner occupants, working with investors on uh, renovating rows, all of these are affordable housing projects. Conversion of the Immaculate Conception Church, uh, conversion of the Chapman Arms in Harvard Square, uh, these are all um, projects that you would not ordinarily walk down the street and identify as being affordable housing. Uh, they are. Uh, we put great efforts into making sure that affordable housing in Cambridge looks as good as or better uh, than the housing the rest of us live in. So that's um, a very quick overview. I'm sorry if I've taken too long, no. uh, but there we go. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Charlie. I know that I could sit here for hours and just listen to Charlie Sullivan um, and, and not miss a beat. Um, thank you for that. Uh, at this time, I would also like to introduce Corrine Espinoza, who's been a great member of our community, contributing in a variety of ways. Um, and she'll share some of that. So Corinne is a senior assistant to the Dean of Harvard, John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. In this role, she is responsible for, budgeting, for budget planning, management, and efficient daily, daily operations of the dean's office while addressing a wide variety of needs and issues within the school and beyond. 
As a member of the board of directors of the Cambridge Community Center since 2012, Corinne served for over a year as the center's interim executive director. At the center, she successfully guided the 86-year-old organization through a leadership transition. Her executive role encompassed strategic and operational responsibility for the center's staff, programs, expansion of the mission, and an 874,000 uh, operational budget. In her tenure as interim, she implemented successful administrative infrastructures, including a best practices model to attract, recruit, and retain diverse staff. Corinne attended Mount Holyoke College as a single parent and graduated cum laude in 2007 with a degree in economics. Educated by a humble background where she witnessed people who worked very hard every day but yet were still unable to feed or house their families. She became involved and interested in applying her academic training toward income inequality and poverty policy in the U.S. She founded Good Bank, a micro lending project which for two years has served people experiencing homelessness in Cambridge. She continues to advocate for pro-poor economic policies. The project that brings Corinne the most joy is her child, a member of the Cambridge Ringe and Latin class of 2017. And I want to say personally thank you. You really were a shining light for the community center, which is probably one of our oldest community pro programs in the city, serving an incredible population of young people. So thank you for stepping up and stepping in. I wish I were Barry Bluestone, but I'm not. You want to switch. I'm, I'm very happy to do that. 872. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Representative Decker. Thank you to my fellow panelists and to the audience, to the Cambridge Historical Society for creating this opportunity for conversation, to the planning committee who took care of the important details without which this event would not be possible. My name is Corinne Espinosa, and this is my story about housing and what home means to me. But before I start, I want to explain two things. First, I'm going to use the word poor a lot. I often talk about resources in terms of a binary. Those who have what they need, enough money for food, shelter, medicine, and those who don't have enough to meet their basic needs, who I call poor. When I say poor, I mean it with the most respect a person can bestow on anyone. Poor is not deficient. Poor is not bad. I use poor with a capital P like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Poor people have taught me most of what I know, and until recently, very recently, I was counted amongst the poor. Second, I'm going to tell you about me and my story, but I'll remind you a few times where I'm representative of millions or even billions of others like me. And at one point in this story, you might want to cheer for me and point to me and say, see, here's proof that if you just work hard enough. And at that time, I'll remind you that I'm actually an exception. While I wish it were true that anyone could share the same end as my story, it's simply not true. We have severe structural, racial, and economic inequality in the US. And where I've made out OK, it's not due to hard work. There are billions of people who work harder than me who will never be OK or have enough to meet their basic needs. So where I've made out OK, it's due to extreme luck. And honestly, it's not fair. So like my parents and my grandparents before me, I was born poor. Here's a picture of little Corinne <laughs> to accompany us on this first part of my story. Like so many poor kids, I moved all the time. We moved 11 times before I was 14, often moving abruptly during the school year. I started working for pay at age 10. I put flyers around my apartment complex and I offered cleaning services. I had a few clients and I quickly realized that cleaning people's toilets for a few bucks was not very fun. The summer I was 10, I babysat two children for nine hours a day while their mom was at work. I did a good job, but as a parent now, I think how desperate that mom must have been to have entrusted her children to a 10-year-old. Since I could legally work, age 14, I worked consistently in jobs from nonprofits to retail to food service. After I dropped out of high school at age 16, I began working full time. As a poor person, I could only take six weeks off for the birth of my child before I had to return to work. When my son was about three, I won a scholarship to attend Mount Holyoke College. This covered tuition and books, 
but I needed money for living expenses, and I worked multiple part-time jobs and still had to take out student loans. But the point of all of that is to say that I'd been working full-time for over two decades, and I had nothing to show for it as far as assets go. So remember, I started poor. No matter how hard I worked or how many hours I worked, in good times I made enough to barely make ends meet, and in bad times, like billions of poor people around the world, I would eat less, borrow more, or look for more jobs. This is all relevant as we think about housing. Let's do a little experiment. I'll ask everybody to close your eyes <laughs> so that you don't worry about what others think about you. So if people have their eyes closed, I want homeowners to take a minute to think about how you ended up with your first home. Raise your hand if you inherited a house. And raise your hand if you got a down payment as a gift when you got married. Or raise your hand if you took a loan, maybe from your parents or grandparents, to get that down payment. Or if you had a free place to live while you scrimped and saved up money to get that down payment. Maybe you stayed with parents or relatives. All right, um, people can open their eyes now. I just want you to keep in mind, though, what helped you get your first home. And think about others who were like me. If you looked at my assets, when during my life could I have ever accumulated money for a down payment? Remember, I come from a poor family, so no one could lend me $50,000 or $10,000. No one in my family happens to live in the area and have an extra guest bedroom, so I was on my own. Since age 17, when I first started living alone, because I didn't have any money for a down payment for a home, my only choice was to rent. Since age 17, I have paid over $300,000 in rent. I have nothing to show for it. It's lost money. Don't get me wrong, I am keenly aware of the privilege of having a roof over my head, of being warm in the cold winter, of keeping my child housed and safe in a dangerous world. But for all those years of work, all those hours of work, I had zero dollars in assets to show. All those paychecks, all those hours away from my baby, nothing to show. I'm going to take a second to remind you that this is one of the parts where it's my story, but it's the story of so many others. All right, so now we're talking about housing, and we're asking questions about what home means to us. When I moved to Massachusetts in 2003, I put my name on a list for affordable housing. In four years, my name never came up, and I moved to a different city. Upon arriving to Cambridge, I put my name on the list for affordable housing, and eight years later, my name came up. I had the chance to be in a lottery to have the opportunity to buy a home. Not a house for free, not even help with the down payment, just the opportunity to purchase an apartment for $300,000. A very expensive apartment, but in Cambridge terms, a very good deal. Now mind you, this was not the little dream house I imagined. I didn't go get to go look at homes and see what kind I preferred. I had no choice at all except to say, yes, I'd like to buy this, or no thank you, I would like to go back on the waiting list. So I wanted this little apartment with my whole heart. All I've ever wanted is for my son to have more opportunities than I did. I wanted to pass this on to him. And as it turns out, actually according to the rules, he can never have a chance to own our place. When I die, it'll go back to the city but at least the money will go to him. Even then, I still wanted it because I knew I would not have a chance to be a homeowner again. I'd already waited 21 years for that chance. I knew I'd lose a lot in the deal, but I did the math and I found it to be, over time, a sound financial decision in the opportunities matrix that faced me. So despite the sad thing I'm about to tell you, <laughs> in seven years I will break even, and this will all be a financial decision that will help my family in the long run. So back to the part where I win the lottery and I have the chance to buy an apartment and to access a mortgage that will accept a smaller down payment than normal. I still need 19,000 bucks for the down payment and for closing costs. So remember that part about I have no savings because I barely made enough all those years to pay my bills? Because like billions of poor people, I had no access to capital, I had to find money in unusual places. I'd been slowly building a life savings for my retirement. And by that time, I'd had $44,000 saved toward my old age in a 401k. 
I took out 36,000 of that so that after taxes, I would have 19,000, which is what I needed in order to make this financial transaction happen. So to be clear, I lost almost half of my life savings in order to swing a down payment, in order to have a home, in order to keep my son in Cambridge, the place that he's lived since he was seven years old. Even though I moved all the time as a kid, I've been able to keep my son in just two school districts for his whole life, and I'm proud of this. This is the place where he's safe, where I'm safe, and the people are pretty nice. So, is any of my story okay? This is my son as a baby. This is us when we first moved to Cambridge. And this is us now. Do we deserve to live in Cambridge? Do we deserve to have a home? Why or why not? What about all the people that aren't here at this talk? I don't see many people from the public housing projects here. I don't see a ton of people of color here. Housing prices in Cambridge are skyrocketing with an average two bedroom apartment between $2,300 and $2,600 per month. One would have to make $40,000 a year before taxes just to pay the rent. No food, no car, no childcare, just rent. Since 2010, prices have jumped and they just keep going up. This is officially a housing emergency. Now I'm here, I'm okay, I'm safe. Many of my friends in my community are not. I look around and I see diversity bleeding out of Cambridge. The diversity that I see staying is largely concentrated in housing projects. What does it mean if all of our diversity is disproportionately poor? 38% of the children at Cambridge Ridge and Latin, our public high school, qualify for free or reduced lunch. For a family like mine, a single mom and a kid, I couldn't earn more than $29,000 and qualify for free or reduced lunch. That means that 38% of the children at CRLS are living off of less than that. Could you live off of that? What choices and opportunities will those families have? Will they be able to purchase a home in the city where they were born, where they were raised and spent their formative years? What about the people like me who desperately depend on their network? Trusted friends to pick a kid up after school if your work meeting's running late, or to take care of a sick kid if you cannot take any more days off of work? If a poor family is pushed out of Cambridge, away from their network and into a new city, how will that help or harm the family? Our questions here tonight are how did we get here? It starts with pressure from universities buying up land and reducing housing stock available to the public. How did we get here? We see dramatic changes after rent control disappears. How did we get here? Structural, racial, and economic inequality across the world, the nation, and this city. What are the challenges? Deciding who we want to be as a city. Do we want only extremely wealthy people and extremely poor people? Do we want to lose our cultural diversity and the rich tapestry of difference? Do we think some people deserve to live here and some people don't? How did we come to that conclusion? Who is the we? Is the we anyone who lives in Cambridge now? Is it anyone who wants to live in Cambridge? Or is it anyone who at one point lived here? Where are the people who are experiencing homelessness? Do they deserve to live in Cambridge? Most young people experiencing homelessness are escaping violence at home. Your home has to be a pretty tough place if you think sleeping outside in the New England winter is better. How about those kids? Do they deserve to live in Cambridge? We have elders on our street. Do the elders deserve a home? Are they a part of the we? I'm ending with only questions because we're here tonight to explore, inquire, and open conversations. Who deserves housing? Is housing a human right? What does it mean if Cambridge prices push people of color and families out of the city? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for having the courage to uh, choose Cambridge as your home and to make it happen. And I also want to say I really appreciate you making it a point of, um, as we share some similar stories, I grew up in public housing in Cambridgeport. Um, Charlie Sullivan pointed to Roosevelt Tower saying that that was familiar to me. 
What he doesn't know is it's familiar because that's where my mother grew up and my father grew up in and out of Washington Elms. Um, and I'm the first homeowner in our family. And people say, you know, you're an example, of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And what we both know is it has nothing to do with pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. And unfortunately, that's a narrative that is often associated with people who are the exception of moving out of the cycle of poverty. So thank you. Um, at this time, it is my honor, and I just think we are, I think it's so cool that Barry Bluestone also lives in Cambridge. Um, you want to talk about housing and urban planning and affordable housing. He is definitely the guy you need to be speaking to um, and who really has a very thoughtful way of talking about what the demand looks like, um, how do we meet it, what does it mean for us as a community. And instead of trying to give his lecture, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him and then we're going to hear directly from him. Um, now I really got to tell you, I'm excited to be here with you. For years I've been wanting to have conversations with you, but I've been too busy doing my job and you've been too busy doing your job, so I read your work. Um, but to be here on the stage is just great with you. Well, I'll tell you, being on the stage with Corinne and with Charlie is an absolute honor for me. Yeah, it's a pretty great and panel. You. <laughs> yeah, hey, you know. Um, I want to say that Barry Bluestone is currently the Stearns Trustee Professor of Political Economy and was the founding director of the Duke Hawkins Center for Urban and Regional Policy and the founding dean of the School of Public Policy and Urban Fair Affairs at Northeastern University. <clears throat> Professor Bluestone was raised in Detroit like our great Mayor Reeves over here, all good comes from Detroit. Um, and at least that's what I'm told constantly, and I believe it now. <laughs> uh, he also attended the University of Michigan, where he received his BA, MA, and his PhD in economics in 1974. At the Dukakis Center, Bluestone has led, well, now he's Bluestone, Professor Bluestone has led research projects on housing, local economic development, state and local public finance, transportation, workforce development, and vocational education the manufacturing sector in Massachusetts, and the assessments of the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center. At the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs, he has co-chaired the Open Classroom Series, a seminar on critical social issues open free to the public each semester. He was also a part of the team that developed the school's master's program in urban and regional public policy. As part of his work, um, Barry, spends a considerable amount of time consulting with trade unions, with industry groups, and with various federal and state government agencies. He appears frequently on local and national radio, and in 2006, he served on the transition team for Governor Deval Patrick. Under the Deval Patrick administration, he served as a member of the Advisory Council to the Massachusetts Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development, as well as the Massachusetts Office of Administration and Finance. He served on the Governor's Economic Development Strategy Council and is now an executive board member of Governor Baker's Advanced Manufacturing Collaborative. From 2007 to 2010, he served as a member of the Community Affairs Research Advisory Board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. And in 2013, he served as a senior visiting scholar at the Boston Federal Reserve Bank. I even walked by your office, but you weren't there that day. Um, in 2015, he was appointed by the Massachusetts Senate to the Commission, Commissions on Housing and Tax Policy. Our own local neighbor and resident, Professor Barry Bluestone. Thank you. Bob. Thank you. See, I've got to get something up in this, right? Whoops. Where are we? I'm going to need some help. I'm usually good at this, but at age 72, I'm not as fast as my son. Oh. Just hiding from you. There it is. There you go. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the Historical Society and the Library for inviting me to come almost 100 yards from my home on Trowbridge Street uh, to be here tonight. Um, when I first arrived in, in Boston, it was 1971. Ken, when did you get here? 68. 68. So we came about the same time. We both come out of Detroit. He went to the exam school. I just went to a Cass Tech. He, I went to Mumford High School, made famous in Beverly Hills Cop uh, by Eddie Murphy. Um, Boston was, and Cambridge was a very different place than it is today. In fact, I came here uh, having, you know, worked my way through the University of Michigan on a Ford assembly line building carburetors and alternators, 
I had no savings, and I was going to Boston College as an assistant professor. Uh, and at Boston College, they pay their assistant professors the same as priests, the difference being that the priests actually do take vows of poverty. <laughs> a as a result, I didn't have a lot of money, and when my girlfriend and I arrived here, we met with a real estate agent, a rental agent, and said, look, we don't have a lot of money. Can you find a place we could afford? And the rental agent looked at me, and he says, do you mind a high crime rate? And I uh, opined that I wasn't particularly fond of homicide, but what did he have in mind? And he said, no, 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 this is an area of, of Boston which has a very low homicide rate, but it has the highest burglary rate uh, in the state. And so I moved into 379 Marlboro Street, Back Bay. <laughs> and this was coming from Detroit. And when Ken and I grew up in Detroit, Detroit was the richest city on the planet Earth. Well, I've been studying housing for at least the last 15 or 20 years. And I'm going to run through a little bit of history and uh, give you an idea of the kinds of things that I've been thinking about recently. Uh, we're about ready to put out the 15th edition of the Greater Boston Housing Report Card on November 29th. I hope you'll join me at the Boston Foundation for that. But one of the things that I've been thinking about since I've lived here in Cambridge for 30 years, and in answer, by the way, to Corinne's question, uh, I'm married into it. My wife uh, had a beautiful house built in 1871 at 101 Trowbridge Street. And so I married not only a lovely, lovely woman, but she has made me a very wealthy man. I'm also a landlord because we have tenants on our second and first floor. And uh, I have two surrogate grandchildren on the first floor. But I've thought a lot about what's happening, particularly in Cambridge and in parts of Boston. And the answer is we've been very successful since 1971. We're attracting population, as you'll see in a little bit. And many of those people who are coming here are young. They're our kids. They're graduate students. They're medical interns and residents. They're tech-savvy entrepreneurs and so forth. In fact, it's millennials that are putting the greatest pressure on our housing market, those 20 to 34 years old, mainly because of the expansion of higher education, uh, which was a pretty small industry way back when Cambridge was founded, and of course, one of the biggest industries in Massachusetts today. Uh, my son, who um, uh, went to school here, but then to Northwestern University, is now teaching fifth and sixth grade in a Hispanic public school in Chicago, and will not be on strike on Monday, uh, lives with three roommates, uh, and they are paying a combined total of $4,200 a month in rent in Chicago. But that's very typical here. Uh, when I first moved into Trobert Street 30 years ago, uh, about half the um, homes on Trobert Street between Cambridge and Kirkland are triple-deckers. And they were owned and lived in by local people. I knew it because at Christmas time, every one of those houses would be beautifully decorated. There's one left that decorates their home, not only for Christmas, but for the Sox, for the Pats, you know, for the Bruins and the Celtics. We also know from the study we did last year, where we did uh, research uh, based on proprietary information on over 115 multifamily uh, developments, uh, that the cost of producing new housing has gone through the roof. It's about $275 a square foot now, including land and soft costs and construction costs. That means um, if you want to build a small, let's say, equivalent of a triple-decker today, a small one, 3,600 square feet, 1,200 square feet per floor, two bedrooms, one bath, let's say the home that Ted Williams, the great baseball player before David Ortiz, lived in at 37 uh, Foster Street in Alston Brighton uh, and paid $100 a month in rent when he got back from World War II, that house, which was built for $38,000 in 1918, would today cost $158,000 if we just took into account inflation. Today, that simple frame 3,700 square foot home would cost $1.1 million to build. And that's why it's so difficult, nay, maybe impossible, to build new housing for working families. We can build some housing for poor folks who qualify for subsidized housing. We do a fabulous job of building homes for millionaires. Um, we've done a great job of building housing, luxury housing in the South Boston waterfront. I have a friend who lives in one of those huge buildings, which is totally leased out. And he loves it because he's a, he has a private concierge. He's about the only person living in that building. Most of those units are owned by Russians, Chinese, Norwegians. 
Um, and I, I've been giving lectures and saying, well, this isn't really housing. I mean, it does have bedrooms and bathrooms and kitchens, but if nobody lives there, it's just bank vaults. We need to build housing. So what I'm going to do is give you an idea of some new ideas about housing, but I want to, since this is a historical society, Charlie's done some of it, is take you back uh, and look at some data. So let's look at the city of Boston, just across the river. Between 19, I'm sorry, 1870 and 1920, 50 years, the population of the city of Boston triples from a quarter of a million to three quarters of a million, right, in 50 years. And it was due to the wave of immigrants from Ireland and Italy and Eastern Europe. And what's fascinating is we housed every one of them, right? And the way we did it uh, for these people uh, during that period of time uh, was to build triple-deckers. This is what happened to the Cambridge population. It's pretty much the same numbers that Charlie just showed you. Tremendous growth, uh, actually growing by more than four times between 1860, just before the Civil War, and 1920. Our population peaked in 1950 at about 120,000 and is still 10,000 lower than it was in 1950. So 60, uh, six years later, we actually have a smaller population than we had in 1950. And the solution, I said, was the classic triple-decker. We built lots of those and about 40% of the housing stock in Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville together are triple-decker units or duplexes today, right? And that was the first demographic revolution, the immigrant revolution. The second demographic revolution occurred between 1950 and 1980, when many of some of us in this room were the so-called baby boom children, right? And this is what happened to the city of Cambridge. The population plummets from 120,000 to 95,000 in just 30 years. We saw this, right? And what happened, of course, is that people came back from the war. They, unlike the first demographic revolution that came to the cities, came to the triple-deckers after World War II with the GI Bill uh, and also with extremely discriminatory FHA financing, people fled the cities into the suburbs. Cambridge lost 21% of its population. Chelsea lost more than a third of its population. Boston lost 30% of its population. But what grew? Braintree, Lexington, Andover, Sharon, Burlington took all the records. You know what Burlington is? It grew by a factor of 10 from 2,400 to 24,000 people in just 30 years. That was the second revolution. And now we have the third demographic revolution. Young millennials and old people like me, right? So if we look at um, uh, the population of Cambridge from 1980 on, through this year, we'll see the population started growing again, about 110,000, still below 10,000, less than in 1950, right? Um, whoops. Uh, but what we see is a change dramatically in the population. So that in 2000, if we look at Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville together, kind of the inner core of Greater Boston, about one third of the population was between the ages of 20 and 34. But if you just look at the last decade, where we have full census data, 74% of the growth in the population of our three cities are 20 to 34 year olds. That's the housing pressure. And you see it all around you. So here's the triple deckers in 1910 with the population who lives there. Here's the same triple deckers in 2016. And that's who's living there now. That's a problem, right? And what does it mean? The pressure on the triple-decker market has been so great and duplexes, this is for all greater Boston, it's actually faster rising here in Cambridge. Since 2009, if you went out and purchased a triple-decker unit, a single de de unit, you would have seen the price double just since 2009. Double, right? And what does that mean? Rents have been going up through the roof. This is for inner greater city Boston. This is Boston, Somerville, Cambridge. Uh, we've seen a 59% increase in rents since 2009. If you're not rich, you can't afford this. It's not being poor. If you're a worker, typical worker, you can't afford that kind of increase in rent. $3,000 times 12 is $36,000 a year just in rent. We know that between 2000 and 2013, 
that median renter household income not adjusted for inflation, not adjusted for inflation, that actually went down when you count that, went up 13 percent, rents have gone up 21 percent, and asking rents, if you're a new tenant, have gone up 27 percent, twice as fast as the typical income. What does that mean in terms of burdens? Back in 2000, about 39 percent of the population of all of Greater Boston, those are the five counties of Greater Boston, about 39 percent paid more than 30 percent of their gross income in rent. By 2011, more than half did. And if you want to look at severely housing burdened families or households, 18% paid more than 50% of their income, more than half their income simply in rent in 2000. More than a quarter of all families in Greater Boston were doing it by 2011, right? So now let's ask the question, what does the future hold for Greater Boston's demography? Well. If you do projections out to 2030, which we have done at the Dukakis Center with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, you'll see that we're going to have a large population increase, but overwhelmingly it's going to be in two demographic groups. People like me, I'll be 72 in December, and 25 to 44 year olds, millennials and seniors. That's where the growth is going to be in the population. Even today, over 75% of uh, households have no children in them. Some of them are young people with you know, three roommates, but 75% of all the housing units in Greater Boston have no children, okay, already. But as we move forward and we see millennials who are coupling up later, delaying child, child rearing, we're gonna see a huge increase in demand for housing, but it's mainly going to be for small units not the four bedroom, three bath, two car garage that we're typical. So what we need are housing for young millennials, for working families, for aging baby booners. And I've been trying to figure out what does that mean. And so I've been talking with a lot of people, including some of the university and college presidents. I've been talking with people at Mass Challenge uh, down on, on uh, Dry Dock Avenue. And we're talking about millennial villages. I don't know if that's the best name, but I'm thinking about something that's built for people like graduate students, medical interns, residents, young chefs, you name it. And building villages, and I'll tell you why I call them a village, which has a range of units from small micro units to, to you know, um, studios and one bedrooms, common shared space with lounges, laundry facilities, seminar rooms, study rooms, music practice rooms, retail establishments on the first floor, roof garden for barbecues near public transit, right? And we have a lot of architects now who are designing these kinds of units. This is Ad Inc, now Stantec. Um, this is what these buildings could look like. They could be very nice. Uh, and what would the new collaborative entail, getting people together to build the housing that would be so attractive to young millennials and some seniors like me that we get out of the older housing stock and turn it back to the working families who need it. All those duplexes, not all of them, but many of those duplexes and triple deckers. We need private developers who would work together, uh, particularly those who would take a reasonable, not excessive investment return. We need to work with public quasi-publics like mass development, mass housing, MHP, mass housing partnership, mass housing investment corporation. We need to get the universities and teaching hospitals, including my own, Northeastern University, to take master leases. Let's say we got BU, BC, Northeastern, uh, Simmons, and a few other schools together, and they all work with the developer. They put up some of these villages, and then they agree to take a master lease, which means they'll guarantee occupancy, market the hell out of them to their graduate students in particular, and medical interns and residents. That makes the financing possible. We've got architects working on what the design might be. We're talking about building a manufacturing facility here for panelized or full units. Almost all of the panelized stuff that's coming in now is coming from either Canada or Pennsylvania. I've been talking with Mayor Walsh about also doing training programs for young people to learn how to those jobs. This is the new Yuhu, the urban housing unit designed by Tamara Roy. Uh, the new president of the Boston Society of Architects. 385 square feet, the prototype only cost $50,000. Put it in mass production, you get down to around $40,000 a unit. We've got to get the building trades on board. 
uh, to encourage them to provide some relief on their normal uh, labor rates for this kind of housing. Uh, we need municipal government to do some reforms of zoning, reduce parking, possibly provide some land, and we need the state government. So that's the idea we have here. I come up with a nine-step program, which starts with getting the governor and our mayors together, learning how to build this new housing, and then sitting down with our universities, our teaching hospitals, other major employers, and say, you've got to be part of the solution. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much. I, I think our panelists, I'm going to ask you one more time, we're going to have a chance to ask questions, but um, I, I could sit here for several more hours just listening to them. Fortunately, um, we are lucky that they are also going to engage us with some um, opportunities to ask questions and hear more from them. But I want to, again, once again, thank all three of you. This was really great. I'm told we have a special uh, fellow from the Historic Society who is being given the privilege to ask the first question here. Where are you? Oh, there you go. Okay, so, so I understand how we're doing this. Is there a microphone that will be passed if someone wants to ask a question? Or should they go up there? Okay, so if you would like to ask a question, I'm going to suggest maybe you quietly slink around and, and, and start to form a line so we can keep this going. Okay, congratulations on your fellowship, and thank you. Why, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Maybe a little louder. Hello. Oh. oh. Yeah, pull the mic down. Okay, here we well, go. here we go. Oh, that sounds better. Uh, so, uh, I'm a millennial who moved here from Chicago eight years ago after college, and I love my adopted town. I love it to death. Um, and so I heard a lot about delicate balances you know, the balance between deep historical roots and innovation, between human dignity and what we've been told it means to be deserving, um, and the difference between houses and homes. Uh, in you all's opinion, what's one thing we cannot afford to forget if we're gonna build a Cambridge we can all be part of? I'd like to start. <laughs> Karen. All right, I'll, I'll say, I'll say with all due respect to um, all the people who are working so hard to preserve our buildings and our city and our, our green spaces that the people matter. So in the neighborhood where our community center is, we are losing people uh, very quickly. I'm thinking of people like uh, Mr. R.J. Jones, Yvonne Gittins, people who have been pillars of the community for so many years who have literally raised thousands of children. If rents push uh, folks out of their homes, if we lose them, that delicate balance starts spiraling out of control in my opinion. So for me, I think the first thing to remember are just that people are part of the history and if we lose the people, we're losing something that we might not be able to get back. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I, I think the thing that I worry most about having lived here a very brief 30 years is, is losing the diversity of our community. Um, diversity by income, diversity by race and ethnic background, um, diversity by just interest. And you know what I love is living in a community which is as diverse as Cambridge has been. That's why I like to live in a city rather than the suburbs. And I would hate to think we get to a point where we're a city that has some very poor people in subsidized housing and lots of rich people who can afford the rents and the prices of Cambridge. And we are rapidly getting to that point. Well, I, I would just say that um, you know, in historic preservation, which is my field, uh, we do a great job of making buildings look good. Uh, certainly the rising economic uh, trends in Cambridge, um, Cambridge has never looked better. But it's perfectly true. Uh, the diversity is, is almost is leaving almost uh, perceptibly as people move out. Um, the city has devoted enormous resources to um, preserving affordable housing, uh, trying to protect people in place. Um, this historical, just to blow our own horn a little bit, the historical commission has had a grant program for uh, almost 30 years uh, to support affordable housing agencies, but 
it has to be more. And I'm not sure what the answer is, but um, we have to do more to enable people to stay in place and a whole range of people to stay in place. I think it's worth noting that Corinne talked about 38% of our high school students at Cambridge Ringe and Latin are on free and reduced lunch. I think Mayor Reeves and I can recall that less than 10 years ago, it was 50% of our high school students at Cambridge Ringe and Latin were on free and reduced lunch. Um, and, and that right there begins to tell you where we're going. Uh, thank you very much for your question and for choosing Cambridge. Hi. Um, I'm very intrigued by your um, I idea of um, millennial villages and having um, smaller units and, and uh, a kind of a com more communal situation. Um, but you're also talking about um, micropods and smaller, um, smaller units uh, before people have families and move out. But, so this is for a particular kind of snapshot. The um, problem, and then you, you uh, mentioned um, that um, they are going to be so attractive that the millennials will move into those and leave older housing, uh, older stock for affordable housing. The problem with that, um, I mean, I've uh, talked to people, uh, millennials who work in Kendall Square, and I said, do you live in Kendall Square? Are you, you know, you, there's a lot of housing. No, we hate Kendall Square because it's too sterile, it's too um, homogenized, and we really like the human scale of the older neighborhoods, the um, interactions of the community, the, um, hu the human context. Um, so the issue is design, and how are you going to get those people back into those, those micropods and leave um, the older housing. And further um, on that point, as a preservationist myself, um, I wish there was more teeth to protect and reuse older houses that are now um, actually under stress for being torn down so uh, developers can um, uh, create rental units, um, which are being taken up by Airbnb, by the way. So that's a whole other issue. But um, so my question is, how are you going to read? Are you going to design in order to um, corral those m millennials and leave the older housing for affordable housing? And I just want to remind: we have about 10 people in line. We've got 25 minutes for questions, and I think it's great. But just for everyone to just keep that in. Sorry. Let me let me just answer very briefly. Uh, I've been we are actually trying to do at this point what we call a demand study. We want to talk to young people and find out more about what they want in their housing and what kind of amenities. I, I've been using my son as my example. He's 25, living with three roommates. He'd actually like to have a smaller apartment of his own with his girlfriend, uh, but he can't afford it uh, even with our help. So one of the things that we're doing is we've been working with lots of architects. Some of these architects look 12 years old. They're actually in their 20s and 30s. <laughs> They're millennials themselves at Stantec and some other groups. We're working with some of our graduate architecture students at Northeastern. I think we have some involved here at GSD. And we're saying, OK, design the housing that you'd want to live in. And I think by having millennials actually design the housing they want to live in, we'll get much closer to the kind of housing that would be acceptable, not for every last millennial, but enough to start taking pressure off the older housing stock. Um, I don't think Harvard has any trouble getting graduate students into their graduate housing along Charles River. We could build stuff that would be a really exciting housing alternatives, uh, particularly giving these young people designing their, their basically their own stock. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I thought all of the presentations were excellent and, and really did um, cover a wide range. And I'm going to speak specifically uh, on Professor Bluestone's presentation. When you mentioned that the average cost for housing is 275 feet, uh, isn't it true that if not the largest other than the actual construction, but close to it, is the price of land? land in most neighborhoods is more valuable than the house that's on it. And uh, tax policy can increase the value of land by frankly keeping taxes low. And I'm not for raising it, 
But um, I, I was hoping you'd say that because that was my understanding. In Cambridge, other than the surtax, the Community Preservation Act, we don't have a line item for affordable housing. To me, that's the biggest disgrace. Yeah. Um, and, and I'd be curious to yeah. hear your thoughts on the that. The problem, I, 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 I understand your concern, and I've looked at it very closely. And the problem is, given the high cost of producing housing, and out of about the $275 on average, throughout the inner core, about 40 to $50 of that, about a fifth of it is just land. It's higher here in Cambridge by far, but overall that's the average. But the real problem is, is that I've, try to, I've tried to think about what would it take in terms of subsidy to build housing for workers? And the answer is, the amount of subsidy is so enormous that we could only build a very tiny amount of housing and it would hardly solve the problem. That's why I've come up with what I often call housing jujitsu. You know, how do you use a different kind of leverage to produce enough housing so that we can get some of the existing housing stock back to the people it was originally intended for. Because trying to build brand new housing stock of two, three bedrooms, two bath, you're talking 800,000 and up. I don't think there are too many working families who can afford that, even if there were a subsidy. And, and I would just add to that, I think this also speaks to legislation that the, um, the, we're looking at the state, right? We also need to make it um, possible for more housing to be built outside of the urban area so that families who are squeezed into the two bedrooms that are here um, and who are in that moderate to middle class income have more options as well and, and good communities that have good schools. But right now, the housing isn't being built in those communities. So because of zoning. Because of zoning. So zone, we hopefully we'll do some big zoning law changes. We'll see. <laughs> Next question. Do any of you have good ideas on how to better utilize the existing housing we have, which are occupied by older people uh, who now, who bought their houses whenever they did, they no longer need that much space. But the question is, if they, if you, you, how, do they how do they move out of it? The, the, the market response right now is you sell your house for a lot of money, a developer buys it, puts money into it, maybe subdivides it, makes it very, very expensive. So there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of housing stock which I think has got occupied by older people who don't want to be in as much space anymore, but it's got to be some way of taking advantage of that. <laughs> uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that we've been talking about in a number of communities, I've been working very closely with Mayor Seti Warren in Newton, is they have a, you know, a very large number of, of households that are, are just like what you suggested. People are now in their 60s and 70s living in 3,000 square foot homes. One of the things we've been talking about is can we convert, can we have zoning that would allow many of those people to convert their homes so that they have an accessory apartment, or what we used to call a mother-in-law apartment. Um, you know, I have a family, you know, we have a house here on Trobert Street. We have two tenants on our second and third floor. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, at some point, I will not be able to take care of that house anymore. I'd like to, you know, have an opportunity of moving into a building that has an elevator, which is the one amenity I'm going to need. Um, but I also thought, wouldn't it be nice if um, I could stay in my apartment and, and uh, somehow have my tenants on the first floor who have two wonderful children, buy that unit and stay there, but also help me. I think we have to figure out new ideas about multi-generational housing. I love the idea of having a six-year-old and a two-year-old on my first floor, but I also realize that this is a family that I've gotten very close to, and I think as I age, if I want to stay in place, literally in place, I would love to have them as permanent residents on the first floor if we could find a way to make that feasible for them. So I think we need to think of a lot of different ideas about how we deal with this demographic shift and provide accessory apartments, provide new ways for younger couples with kids to uh, get financing to purchase units in, in homes that do have multi-units. There's a lot of that I think we have to think about. Thank you. 
Hi, thank you for the talks. They were really great and I learned a lot. Um, I was wondering what, um, what, what is the role of uh, MIT and Harvard's real estate acquisition in um, making housing less affordable in Cambridge in history? There's probably an array of opinions on that. It, it, it certainly was the case in the post-war period that um, um, Cambridge real estate market felt a great deal of pressure from students doubling up in apartments and displacing um, um, other renters, family renters, you know, two or three or four or five uh, graduate students, uh, often veterans in the early years and then just ordinary graduate students. Uh, could pay, each pay almost the whole rent of a single family that had previous, previously occupied an apartment. So landlords found it extremely uh, lucrative to rent to students. Um, Harvard, um, I, and that was one of the impetus for rent control in 1972, I think. Um, uh, Harvard got some of the message um, and has built more graduate student housing uh, there's now, I think, in 2010, 17,000 uh, uh, people living in group quarters in Cambridge, which would include the dormitories of Harvard, MIT, and Leslie, and a few other smaller institutions. Uh, that's um, an increase of probably seven or 8,000 over 10 years before, according to the census. Um, I'm not sure I've seen that much construction, but that's what the numbers say. So uh, the universities, I think, have got the message finally to take the pressure off local housing markets that may be happening in Boston. I know Northeastern has been building. No, okay, uh, they haven't. But that's one of the one of the uh, many issues that affects our housing markets. If I could just add, actually, of the nearly. 40 institutions of higher education in the inner core of Boston. Harvard and MIT have actually been outstandingly good citizens when it comes to producing housing for graduate students. We, we have no housing for graduate students at Northeastern, none. 92% of graduate students are living in the neighborhoods, not in housing. And part of the problem is I have graduate students who live in Central Square, because there's no alternative for them uh, in, in at that, that Northeastern has. So I've been arguing, and I would have said it in greater detail, I've been talking with the governor, I've been talking with Mayor Walsh, I've been talking with Mayor Curtitino, I've been talking with some folks here about really getting the universities to belly up. And I'm not talking so much about Harvard and MIT, but I'm talking about the Northeasterns, the BCs, the BUs, and so forth. I'm sorry, I meant to clarify. I, I don't mean um, Harvard and MIT uh, graduate students and that spillover effect. I mean specifically their real estate holdings within Cambridge. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a longer answer and there's a lot of people waiting, so I, I think that we could probably dedicate an entire night to a really good conversation around the university and their acquisition of property. Next question. Um, Professor Bluestone, you sort of outlined a potential development plan to make those millennial villages economically possible, which involves various stakeholders giving up a little here and there. It reminds me a bit of the Affordable Care Act, which, although it's accomplished a lot, is starting to show some strains as a result of its origins. Would you comment on that in any way you'd like? <laughs> So the relationship between affordable housing and Obamacare. Let's see if I can do that in 30 seconds. Yeah, that would be good. Um, I, clearly, what I'm talking about here is building a coalition larger than we've ever had before of developers, architects, designers, city officials, state officials. Uh, I'm not talking about building a complicated healthcare system. I'm talking about creating a coalition that we've never quite had before including actors who have not played any role, primarily the university and, uh, the universities outside of Harvard and MIT, although I'd like to see them do more, and the, and the large teaching hospitals. And that's what I want to, that, those are the people I want to bring to the table. And I, I can tell you, the president of my university is not happy to hear me say that. He's got other issues he's concerned about. God bless him. But I think we have, I'm sorry, 
we have to get the universities and the teaching hospitals to step up and become part of that coalition. The neat thing is we've got loads of wonderful architects, some developers, we've got city officials, we've got um, state officials, I worked also on the Massachusetts Senate uh, Housing Committee, as Marjorie knows, um, that are ready to step up. And I think we have business uh, interests, including the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, the Mass Competitive Partnership, it's now time to bring them all together around one idea which is not that complex like affordable house. Hell. Thank you. Next question. Hi, my name's Adam. Um, I'm studying housing and community development at MIT's Urban Planning Program. And the question is pretty simple. How can students, whether they're in the Urban Planning Program or just generally students, help to create more affordable housing, maybe help with this millennial vision for uh, this new form of housing? Well, I'll, I'll say one quick thing, which is that a lot of people are doing a lot of really important work on this. So Black Lives Matter Cambridge, for example, has some very specific policy recommendations. Um, there are lots of organizations that are working on this. So I would say that um, just doing some search of, of folks that you can network with to learn more might be one step. And I would say it's also for students to put the demand back onto the universities, right? The housing that's being offered has to be interesting enough and affordable enough that it's not worth living in a neighborhood. While some graduate students want to live in neighborhoods because it feels more comfortable, there's quite a few graduate students who may live in neighborhoods but have no relationship to the actual residential neighborhood. And the question is, what is the university doing to make it more of an incentive and more affordable? And I think that's the, that's the demand that students can bring back to the university as well. I will also say, because I think it's important, we're not talking as, as Corinne, I think, really was the face of this, is we're not just talking about bricks and mortar that make sure that more people can live here or different kinds of people can live here. It's also about who's living here. And I will put it back onto the universities who are two of the largest employers in the city, that what you pay your employers and the, what you're expecting for them to pay in their health care costs, we want to tie this into health care, that also makes a difference. If you can work full time at one of these large universities and on a full time salary cannot pay for a year's worth of rent because your salary is less than what it would cost for an average rent, that's a problem. So I would say weigh in on those as well. Let me just add a thing very simply. You're at DUSP, Department mm -hmm. of Urban Studies and Planning. Yeah. I know it well. You should get together with Professor Reeves, right here, Professor Reeves of MIT. <laughs> and one of the things you can do is that you have people who are interested in architecture, you have people who are interested in real estate finance, you have people who are interested in design, you have people who know how to do surveys. It would be wonderful to get all of the graduate students in DUSP and other graduate students at MIT to really work together and say, what kind of housing would we really like? What would we go, where do we want it? What price points with what amenities? We have to find a way of convincing developers that the demand is there and that kind of work would be very powerful. Okay. Dr. Reeves, the student, get together. <laughs> Hi. Um, Problem solved. Yeah, oh, great. I'm sounding like Trump. Oh, my God. Oh, no, you're um, not. I'm sorry. <laughs> Problem solved. It's not possible. I didn't use the word huge once. Yes, you did. Once. I did? Yeah, up there. Oh, no. It's all right. <laughs> I, know, I know somebody uses a lot more than you do. Um, <laughs> So I, too, turn to my own millennial for my market research. My daughter uh, lives here, and uh, she and her boyfriend have gone down to Troy, which is an ad inc building uh, in the SOA district, which is almost a dead ringer for what you described. Right. And so she's all over it. And so if we accept that as our uh, research uh, sample of two, that that is a desirable building, and as we are standing here in Cambridge, my question is, can, what, are the, what is the one practical change in zoning law that we could do here in Cambridge to allow such a model to go up? Well, um, I, I'm reminded of the recent Globe article about Somerville zoning, uh, which um, included a, a map of uh, all of the uh, as of right current structures in Somerville. I think there were 22 out of uh, 17,000 structures in Somerville that were uh, conforming to the zoning on the lots they were built on. Uh, zoning has been used um, as a tool 
uh, to restrict construction. Uh, one of my favorite streets, Antrim Street, uh, it's been shown could never be reproduced under current zoning. Uh, those beautiful uh, gable end houses could not be built in that configuration. Um, so it is zoning reform, I think, is uh, kind of the basic question, bas basic answer to that right. question. I think Charlie's exactly right, and that's why I think the Senate bill, which the House has not passed, is really critical that we put pressure on the House, uh, which would reform uh, in many constructive ways zoning. I think you also, I don't know if, if Cambridge has this, Boston only allows those kind of units in very small areas of the city. We're working with the city of Boston to expand that dramatically. People are opposed to that, although I think now with some of the new designs, more people are coming around to see that this is perfectly wonderful housing. There were a lot of people who thought triple-deckers were terrible, right? We even yeah, saw that. But the triple-deckers made it possible for people to live here in Cambridge. And I think we have to have you know, new ideas about what we think is acceptable. I know there are going to be a lot of people, maybe even some in this room, who are upset with new housing that doesn't come with parking. But most of our kids are riding bikes, or they're taking the T. They don't need you know, one uh, garage space per, per car, and garage spaces are hideously expensive. Yeah. So there are a lot of small reforms we could make that would make it easier for developers to build the kind of housing we need in this city. And I, I just want to say that the, the zoning laws that Barry's referring to, it's really important because it's not urban legislators that are, are stopping this, right? So you could call all your Cambridge reps, and we're right there with you, call all of your Somerville reps, you know, even to some extent your Arlington reps, the, the, the urban areas or all your Boston reps are supporting this. The question is, is how do you get legislators who support, who represent suburban communities, and the message that they are being delivered strongly is, we do not want to make it easier for more people to come in and live here. And the reasons will be, not because we don't want more people, but um, well, some might say that, but you'll hear more about what will it, it will do to our infrastructure, to our roads, to our schools, to our local aid, um, and, and so, I would say that for those who are interested in that particular issue, talk to your friends who live in other communities who care deeply about housing and maybe replicate these kind of conversations because when we can think about housing beyond bricks and mortar and think about housing dictates the kind of experience we have as human beings and how we define ourselves as a community and, and live and, and what that life looks like and feels like. So if those are the kinds of conversations we can inspire in other communities, um, and that density in and of itself enables a lot of that kind of rich experience that many of us choose to live here in Cambridge. Those conversations have to be inspired in other communities outside of Cambridge and Boston as well. This legislation is important, and it's, it is um, not a, a sure thing that it gets passed easily. I mean, one of the problems we have in the suburbs, we have some suburbs who think if we move from two acres per single family house to one acre, we'd have too much density. <laughs> and, and to say that's their experience. So, we can laugh about that because that's not how we live, but the question is to really move them, to move them into allowing and supporting their reps to vote differently. How do we have conversations that actually talk about the richness of what comes with density and how to support that? So thank you for your question. Next question. I am a long-term Cambridge resident uh, in the middle income, and I've ne the affordable housing does not provide any help in this uh, income level and but still renting or buying at a at an ordinary level is not really possible either so now i'm a tenant of harvard university thanks to what they agreed when rent control ended uh, but that's my only choice and uh, so th they have middle income help now but it's still not enough to help people at that level so just want to um, mention that. I think You're your right. point is taken, and there's local city councilors who I know are hearing that. And uh, I think right after you, the next question is coming from, uh, he'll always be my mayor, but I guess Professor Reeves as well, um, who can also speak to some of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, I just want to say what a great job everybody did. I have a quick comment and then a real question. Um, some of you know that in my new life, I'm at MIT as a visiting professor in urban studies and planning. So a part of that invitation was the question, well, what would you like to do? 
And part of my answer was I would really like to spend a lot of time on the question of how do you build housing for people who are not millionaires? This is not just an American question. This is a European question. In, in London, 80% of the housing that's for sale is affordable to only 20% of the people who live in the city. So this is a, a phenomenon that is many places and no one has solved the riddle. So in my first semester, I taught a course entitled The Future of American Cities. And one of the uh, sessions was about how to build housing for people who are not millionaires. And I invited four Cambridge developers, progressive people like David Opposian, uh, Mr. Nagar from Central Square, who have been approved for a new housing building. And their answer was this, it cannot be done. And this is in a situation where I said, what if the city worked with you to not give you the municipal lots, but find some form of ownership where land costs would not be your issue? Their answer unanimously was that the cost of materials and the cost of labor combined do not make it possible. So I'm off looking at other kinds of housing, like in Sweden, where 10 families get together and they kick out the middleman and they build something they can all live in like. And I plan to go see that. Here's the question. Typically in Cambridge, our understanding has been that our demographics, uh, when we went from a city of 120 down to a city of less than 100 and then back up, had a lot to do with the fact of family size changed from the 50s until the 21st century. I had never seen charts before that indicated this outflow to the suburbs. Are both things true, or how would you parse what the change is mostly? Because it, this, I'm so glad to come and learn something I never he heard before, but I think we're all lifelong learners. Who would like to take that? <laughs> <laughs> Professor? Um, the first, the first part of your question is about cost. And you're absolutely right, because we've talked with all those developers and they told us the same thing. They were thrilled to be able to build luxury housing. You know, if you can sell a unit at the top of Millennial Towers for $35 million, you're gonna make a good rate of return, right? Um, they do not know how to cover their costs for a family, let's say, of income 60 or even $70,000, middle income families. It's around the median here in, in, in Greater Boston. Land costs are part of it, but it's still a small part, and as you said, the construction costs are really the key. That's about 55% of the total cost, or 58% on average. That's why I've been working with all of these people about how we could bring in panelized construction, modular construction, uh, that Yuhu prototype is under $50,000. That's the prototype. Now, let's say you put two of those together, you'd have almost 700 square feet. Put three of those together, and you're up to 1,011, 1,200 square feet. That's a reasonable, good size. You're still talking only about $150,000 to build that. And if we could then do it here rather than just import it from Pennsylvania or Canada, we'd also be creating a huge number of jobs. Because between now and 2030, between now and 2030, we have to create 160,000 units of new housing in the five counties of Greater Boston. You could build a manufacturing facility and that would be 20 years of full-time, 24-hour, around-the-clock work for hundreds, if not thousands, of our young people. You tie that in with, let's say, Madison Park, a vocational school in Boston, some of our technical programs here out of Cambridge Ridge Latin, you start training kids for jobs that pay seventy, eighty thousand dollars by the time you're 27 years old. So there are ways of putting this together in such a way that we begin to cut down on the costs, and we also provide some real great opportunities for some of our younger people to make the kinds of incomes where they could actually buy what they built. The Democrat. All right, I think we have time maybe for a couple more questions. Hi, my name is Mary. I'm a senior at the Cambridge Vincent in Latin. Um, and I have um, like two questions. One is what, what do you think makes Cambridge Cambridge? 
Um, that's a question I've been thinking about a lot. And two, um, where do these millennial villages go? Um, I currently live in North Cambridge, and developments have like come up there. And my my neighborhood of North Cambridge has completely changed because of the new people those developments have brought in. And so when I hear millennial villages, what I hear is like completely different communities impacting current communities. And I'm trying to understand like what tensions do you think are going to arise out of that, and whether that will maintain the culture of Cambridge that makes it so special. So Mary, first of all, thank you. I know you do a lot of work in the community and I see you and I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I want to say what I think makes Cambridge Cambridge. I've only been here for about 10 years and it's when you stop at a stop sign and you see a bike go by and someone in hijab go by and someone on a skateboard and someone with a tall mohawk and then little kids running by. You, you just see everything. You see this, I think I called it in my talk, tapestry, this beautiful tapestry of all sorts of things. That teaches me every day things that I didn't know before. That teaches my child how to be a person in this global community and how to understand people, how to respect people from different backgrounds, um, people who love different people. It's important and it's a lifelong lesson. So to me, Cambridge is that rich tapestry. Um, that's Cambridge for me. Yeah, I just want to say, I think also, thank you for being here as a high school student. And this is your community that you're really trying to figure out. How do we make sure that you get to stay in this community? And for me, one of the things that makes Cambridge is today is having a conversation with somebody who grew up in Cambridge. He's in the private sector. Um, he has worked on um, issues uh, facing Cambridge youth for years. And I was trying to follow up about a family that I knew who the, um, the, the daughter of a peer of mine who I knew was looking for affordable housing and is a teacher in, in Cambridge. Grew up here and she's teaching here and she cannot afford to live here. And I had reached out to several offices in the city that would help her look, make, make sure she was applying to all the right programs. And in less than 10 words, because I couldn't recall her name, um, her, her mother's name. In less than 10 words, this, this other person and I had this conversation, and he knew exactly who I was talking about. And I thought, for me, the multi-generation of people who choose to stay in the city after they grew up here, it's really important because it is a part of the fabric of passing on that continuity of what threads us together as a community in neighborhoods, and it makes a difference in, in how we support each other. So for me, part of the multi-generation of, of allowing the next generation, you, to be able to come back here when you're ready, if you decide to go off on your own, wherever that is, and then come back here and put your roots down, that's important that we have a path for you and, and your peers. And for me, that, that's important to Cambridge. Yeah. Let Thank me just, you. I'll add one thing, and that is I want to make it very clear, and maybe I didn't make it as clear as I could have, that I'm not suggesting we build a lot of millennial housing in Cambridge. I'm just telling you, I know of a lot of young people who are residents, medical people, uh, and, and students from campuses all over who have selected Cambridge because of the wonderful, that's why you see the bicycles and the skateboards and the mohawks, right? Um, I don't want them all to leave, but I'd like to find housing in Boston, in Revere, in Lynn, in Malden, uh, where there is land where we could develop millennial housing, Quincy, on good, public transit getting better in the next 50 years. Um, that's what I'm thinking about. It's optimistic. <laughs> next question. Hi, my name is Camila Chavez Cortez. And um, in this uh, rich tapestry, we have um, a uh, San Francisco based uh, real estate investment firm that is about to develop like 40 acres of land that in North Point. Uh, that's mixed development and parks, et cetera. So I want to know what kind of opportunities this developer has for Cambridge in affordable housing and in these kind of villages, or what kind of things uh, are they going to bring into this new pie, because it's a whole new development. and. Um, that's my first question, if anybody can answer it. I have another one. I think we're going to stick to one question. So is that the question that you want to ask? Well, the other one was basically to get the ratio of how much square footage was built in the last five years compared to how much of it was really affordable housing. So I would say the second question is probably better asked for maybe some of the city councilors who are here. Um, the first question, I will just say, all I can tell you is that 
Um, we, we, I don't know the details of what, this, of what the next stages of North Point are, but I know that they're moving into the next stage. What it brings is more housing. Um, it probably, um, it, all I can tell you is what it brings is more housing. The question of because more housing is being develop, developed and because of inclusionary zoning, which the council is, uh, is taking on actively to increase the number, whenever you build housing, a certain number of units have to be affordable that the city manages through a lottery. So part of the challenge of our community and why I'm so thrilled that the Historic Society is having these conversations is what we have seen if you were, um, I don't know, if you were awake in the last two years and you were paying attention to local politics in Cambridge, you will see one of the lightning rod issues that really touched people in very deep ways. People who have known each other and have worked together as friends and supporters for decades found themselves deeply on um, feeling disappointed by one another and their point of view of how do you move the city forward to meet the needs of housing and keep it affordable. And while many people had shared values, very different ideas about how to do that, and in fact there are many friendships to this day that I know that are still either in the process of trying to repair or have been damaged. And one of the, 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 the lightning rod of that is there is the school of thought that you don't get more affordable housing if you don't build more housing, including market rate housing. And I think part of this three-part series has been is to say, let's explore what has housing, not just affordable, but what has housing looked like over the centuries? Who has it housed? How did it get here? What were the shapes? What were the sizes? And where are we going with that? And, and so I hope that people will follow the series over the next two. And I'm going to tell you that the next one is October 27th. That's going to be at the Cambridge Community Center, which I'm excited about. If you haven't been there, please come. It's a wonderful community resource. And then also on November 17th at the Cambridge Public Library in Central Square. Um, I'm not answering your question directly because none of us are local um, officials working on this project, but I see the vice mayor here and I know he's always happy to talk. Uh, and I will just say that I, I want to say that we need to be doing more of this because these kinds of conversations, I believe, need to be taking place out of a high stakes election where we can continue sharing our thoughts. I have one more question. Peggy, I'm going to leave it to you and then I think we're going to, I think that was partly my wrap up, but we'll make it official.